Welcome to our TMIT National Research Testbed webinar, our High Performer Series. Uh, this is Charles Denham, and uh, I'm uh, your host today, and I'm really delighted that we have a fantastic topic and some great speakers and, and, and panelists. I draw, want to draw your attention to uh, slide three for those of you that have slides right away. Make sure to turn the volume up on your computer so that you get maximal uh, sound and so your auto, audio quality is the best. On slide four, you'll see if you go to participants, if you do not have good audio, click on the participants icon at the top of the page and click on the request phone and you can get a, a dedicated phone line that will help you get uh, the best audio. On slide five is our landing page at safetyleaders.org. And for those of you that don't have slides, go to www.safetyleaders.org. In the upper right-hand corner quadrant, you'll see upcoming events. If you click on that, uh, you could click on today's Harmonizing Healthcare Emergency Codes uh, line, and that will take you to a page uh, that everyone can see if they have their slides, which is uh, on slide six. And that way you can come back, those of you that are watching now and those of you that are watching this on demand, this is where further resources, downloads of the slides are available. And for those of you that are logging on right now and don't have slides, go to safetyleaders.org in the upper right-hand quadrant. You can click on this webinar. You'll come to a page where you can download the PDFs of the slides. On slide seven, I want to remind you uh, of, to, um, uh, to know what our uh, social media addresses are. On slide eight, we have our purpose statement and the, uh, for TMIT, uh, and we're thrilled. Uh, I think March will have done our 100th um, uh, national webinar in this series. We've done oh, well over 100, but this is uh, sequential webinars on the series. And our purpose has been to measure our success by how we protect and enrich the lives of families, patients, and caregivers. And to quote uh, uh, Bill Adcox, who will be an a, 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 a reactor today at MD Anderson, those we serve and those who serve. Um, our mission is to accelerate performance solutions that save lives, save money, and create value in the communities that we serve. I won't go into our disclosure statement, however, none of us have any relationship with anyone or any product, service, or technology uh, that is sold or referable to the topics today. Uh, on slide 10, you can see that we have uh, a great list of speakers and reactors. Uh, we have Dr. Bill Sharp from LSF, Ed Ode, uh, Kyle, who uh, will also be uh, speaking on behalf of OSF. We have James Mitchell and Aaron uh, Friedkin from Texas Children's. Uh, we have uh, Chief, uh, the Chief Security Officer and Chief of, of the UT uh, uh, Police here at Texas Medical Center, where I am today, uh, uh, Bill Adcox. Vicki King, who works with him, who's a terrific, uh, uh, has a terrific uh, history in law enforcement and uh, emergency response. Dr. Greg Boats, who's sitting with me today, who's a full professor at the University of Texas uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center, uh, also has an academic appointment at Stanford. So I'll start off by just addressing, as I usually do, a quick news update, and then also the results of our August 16, uh, our August 2016 webinar polling. Uh, this is just a terrible image, and we know that this is a closed uh, audience, and so we wouldn't want to send it out to the public, but the image you see on slide 13 is one that was released earlier in the last couple of weeks by a law enforcement organization, uh, and it, the story is that the two older people in the, uh, that were driving an automobile uh, were both uh, uh, highly impaired by heroin. Uh, in fact, uh, the police officer stopped the car because of erratic uh, driving, and when, King, when he came up, uh, they were um, uh, completely out of it. And, uh, and then um, the fellow that was driving the car started to try to drive the car again, and uh, so, um, and the problem was they had had a small child in the back seat. Now, gratefully, they've they've blocked out the face of the child. But this opioid overdose crisis that we're seeing um, is really hit mainstream. And CNN covered this, and this is a story they'll likely continue to cover. But law enforcement released this picture because they were seeing such an incredible increase in this problem, which we've covered on multiple webinars this year. Um, Secondly, I'd like to draw your attention to uh, September, the September issue of the Journal of Patient Safety. I was formerly the editor-in-chief. These are great. Or these look like great articles. We haven't read them yet. However, the topics, as you can skim through them, really look like terrific tactical, practical articles. 
So uh, we uh, would uh, uh, really highly recommend that you look at them. So let's address our uh, polling from last month, and then we can get on to our topic today. Uh, Dr. Jean Huddleston from the Mayo Clinic, who has led the mortality reviews of over 10,000 patients at the Mayo Clinic, spoke uh, both in July and August. And in our part two, and we highly recommend these are what some of the best webinars we've ever had in really important work uh, that uh, our audience really uh, resonated with. And we pulled the audience regarding this review. I just pulled a couple of slides to remind you, those of you that uh, were in the webinars and those that haven't and were watching on demand or seeing it for the first time, uh, the slide of omission versus commission and the issues that contributed to some aspect of the deaths of these sequentially evaluated deaths at the Mayo Clinic, over 10,000. Uh, look how many of the uh, issues are issues of omission versus what we're constantly studying and working on in patient safety of commission, yeah, misdiagnosis, resuscitation, failure to rescue, procedural issues, documentation and communication, triage, uh, infection, uh, and then we start to see those of, of commission. And so uh, terrific review, and I really recommend that uh, everyone consider joining her collaborative, which uh, uses the methodology you see on slide 17, where they realized instead of focusing on the term adverse events, they focus on issues and, and detoxify the blame-shame cycle and really say, these are issues, what could we tackle? And this is the hierarchical approach that they follow as they uh, study these uh, harmful events. And we're going to be using it in some of the work we're doing this year, a, a, a different topical area, but what a, great, uh, what a great framework. And it's been fire tested and field tried at the Mayo Clinic with great success. We asked the question, I am interested in a webinar with speakers who have launched mortality review from scratch. We ask our audience, look, this is a great idea. The collaborative is there. Would you all like a webinar that addressed that? And 57% of you that attended uh, gave it a 10. We had 600, regi 600 organizations registered with an average of three to four people per line is what we estimate. And so the audience responded uh, in a very strong way. So we will, we will respond by getting groups, and Gene is interviewing groups that will come on and say, here's how we started from scratch and here's where we went. We asked the open, the, the uh, free text question, the mortality review topics I want to learn more about are, and as you skim through them, you'll see a number of them uh, that we all relate to, sepsis and heart failure and hospital-acquired infections and how to get MDs to champion and buy in. I won't read the line item. Take a look at the slides. Again, our speakers today are terrific. They're going to focus on harmonization of emergency codes, but we just want to uh, draw your attention to what we had covered last uh, time. Uh, I'm sitting here with Dr. Greg Boats, who uh, we've been working closely with uh, and on a, on a program called MedTAC, Medical Tactical Focus on the Leading Causes of Death in Children K through College, and actually now we find in the workforce as well, um, focused on cardiac arrest, choking and drowning, opioid overdose, anaphylaxis, active shooter events, transportation and non-transportation accidents, and bullying. And uh, so this uh, focused work we've uh, been introducing you to, we asked the question, are you interested in webinars on these uh, MedTAC causes of death of healthy people? These would be those you serve and those in your organizations who serve. We're running the numbers right now in the organizations we work with on how many sudden cardiac arrests will happen in, in the people that work at the institutions and those that learn at the institutions as well as their family households. 41% gave it a 10, 83% agreed. You can see the numbers, pretty strong response. The, the next topic was regarding the care huddles uh, concept, and this was really envisioned by Dr. Boat sitting next to me, originally called it uh, the health huddle. And this is the idea of any time you have a group event of any type, uh, being able to assemble people who will be responsible for scene safety, calling 911, uh, meeting the first responders, helping with the uh, AED, um, addressing stop the bleed issues that might be related to active shooter events and finding the caregivers and finding a parent at a, at a school event. It turns out that one quarter of the sudden cardiac arrest in kids, and this is a very high cause of death in children that we didn't realize is a real epidemic, one quarter of them happen at uh, athletic events. So now we're piloting this care huddle concept in a school, in a very large church, and in <clears throat> uh, uh, multiple venues to test it, and it's been very well received. 
Now, you can see we get a nice bell curve on these topics. We had 11% said that they uh, wanted to be involved in a community of practice with uh, projects like this, and you see a spread of the audience. And so we're gonna, we are gonna start a community of practice and we'll reach out to those that are really positive on that. We asked the question, are you interested in a webinar on all cause harm to those we serve and those who serve? Again, this concept of uh, our workers and our, uh, the patients that we serve, and we got a very strong response with this. 52% of you gave it, uh, uh, gave it a 10, uh, and 91% uh, agreed. So we will be responding with a framework for all cause harm uh, for healthcare institutions, focusing on hospitals, um, and then the last uh, polling question, which led to this discussion, came from uh, Dr. Bill Sharp, who was uh, uh, on the call today and who's going to be a speaker with us today. And uh, he addressed uh, this uh, experience that they had uh, at OSF of uh, identifying that harmonization of uh, emergency codes was critical. So I put this slide up just to introduce the topic to see if people were interested in it. And then we asked the question, are you interested in it? And uh, the, here's how you responded. 70% agreed with 32% of you giving it a 10. And we said, we absolutely have to focus on this. We're gonna go for it. So you told us you wanted it. Uh, some folks didn't, but I'm sure that they may not have signed on, but others did. Um, and the last uh, uh, free text question was, what things are keeping you up at night? As a safety or quality leader or as an administrator, we've got 10 to 15% of our audience are in the C-suite, CEOs, CFOs, chief nursing officers. Um, and I won't review the topics, uh, but take a look at them. We always review these carefully so that we can uh, tie down and focus uh, uh, our webinars to satisfy what uh, uh, you're interested in. But you can see on the second page, sepsis was really common. So. Let's move to the introduction of the topic today. And this, this, this was a slide that I showed uh, previously regarding the um, Hospital Association of Southern California responding to a terrible event where a code was misinterpreted and not under, well understood that led to three deaths uh, because uh, uh, a, a family member had a gun and the code that was called was not the code uh, of, uh, uh, of somebody with a gun and as a result, there were three deaths. And Hass took it upon itself to, um, to uh, conduct a study of uh, over 200 hospitals, had academicians really study and dig down into the emergency codes and developed a standardized approach. And this is the updated approach that you see um, on slide 31 of their codes. Now, the code experts on harmonization are gonna be speakers, so I'm just providing these to you uh, as, and as, as an example. So we've got a series of five or six slides here just to describe for you kind of and the evolution and what various states are doing. So slide number 33 is the Colorado uh, set of codes. And you can skim through those and see the topics are very similar to what we all have. Um, these are the codes from the state of Louisiana. Different set of codes, different set of topics. Some are not the same as the prior. Uh, here are the codes from Kentucky. And again, these ha I'm sure have been updated, but we pulled these from the literature and from what, from what uh, um, Dr. Sharp has shared with us as they were looking at the, the review of these. Uh, Florida Hospital Association set of codes. And so we see what we see across major healthcare institutions. Uh, these are the Kentucky codes um, that, uh, that there, many of them are the same and many of them are different and some have uh, adopted uh, uh, plain language and simple text uh, so that people could understand them. This idea of plain language uh, is going to be addressed today by our, our speakers and the idea, first harmonizing what the codes are and the color code, but then can you move to <clears throat> language that is plain language because it's hard to remember what those are. And so uh, Homeland Security has been focusing on this as well uh, after 9-11 and uh, over time in response to uh, the, uh, these problems. So there are, there are a number of uh, references in the literature uh, on these. This is the HASC latest uh, a set of uh, slides uh, or, set, or codes. So this has really been a, a fantastic opportunity for us uh, and we're here at Texas Medical Center with eight 
very large organizations that collectively have 8 million patient encounters. We've got the world's largest children's hospital, the world's foremost cancer center, um, and uh, there are 100,000 people that work uh, within walking distance and 60,000 students that are very close, not within walking distance, but if you pull them together and 160,000 cars come in every day to the parking on a 1,300-acre area, and many of the clinicians uh, are manning various hospitals that have different codes. And so we're really studying this now. So what got us out of this was Dr. Bill Sharp, who uh, is the physician change agent uh, at uh, um, OSF Healthcare Systems. Uh, I've known Bill for many years. He's, he was just an amazing champion of patient safety. He is a general surgeon, you know, understands the full continuum of care. Um, he was a staff surgeon at OSF. Uh, and uh, his interest in safety and quality began uh, with the OSF uh, Healthcare Patient Safety Collaborative. A man of great integrity, great intellect, and always a champion of innovation. Uh, Bill, uh, thank you so much for drawing us, uh, drawing our attention to this uh, uh, this area. And then uh, Ode Kyle, who um, uh, we just met, but has a very just an amazing uh, experience uh, starting out as a biomedical engineer, working with the Joint Commission, working as, as an advisor and consultant to others. He's had 41 years of direct experience in healthcare, 15 years in direct experience in the management of facilities. Um, he's provided cons consultation to more than 100 organizations around the world in clinical engineering, life safety, occupational and environmental, <laughs> and environmental health safety. And when a guy like Bill Scharf recommend something, somebody so highly as he did uh, owed, we said, well, we've got to have you uh, 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 come and speak to us. So these two gentlemen will be speaking uh, to us uh, today, representing the, the journey that o OSF went through, and then we'll move on to Texas Children's and, and their experience, and then have a great opportunity for us to have uh, our reactors react and the, the, the speakers react on the topics. So with that, I'll turn it over to the gentleman from OSF. You there, Bill? Yeah, this is old Kyle, and I'm not sure Bill may have his phone on mute. Uh, we have a, a short slide presentation that summarizes the, the journey that we traveled to get from um, an uncoordinated emergency preparedness code designation system to a harmonized system that covers the entire OSF healthcare system, which consists of about a dozen hospitals and roughly 300 other than hospital sites, including physician offices, prompt cares, outpatient surgeries, a couple of data centers, and uh, a number of administrative King buildings. and Bill Adcock has joined the meeting. A number of administrative buildings. And the opportunity came to our attention when during a meeting. Bill, has joined the meeting. Hey, Bill. Um, an employee who was attending a meeting away from their home facility um, heard a code yellow announced on the overhead paging system. Um, in this case, it was at, at the facility hosting the meeting, it was a request for patient assistance, but at the home hospital, it was a bomb threat. So this person became quite agitated and, and uh, basically stood up and said, isn't somebody going to do something? And they said, no big deal. We hear those 10 times a day when a staff member needs help with a patient. Uh, for some reason that's beyond the ability of a single individual to handle it. And um, that small event kicked off a pretty big initiative. Um, Bill and Chris Abercrombie and some others did a, an assessment, and we found out that there are, at that time, there were 31 different codes and alerts within the OSF healthcare system. And a number of them conflicted with each other by meaning. They, one in one location meant something and a different meaning in a different location. And the problem that presented is we have a lot of people, mission partners, that's our term for employees, um, who travel to many venues in the system. In, in my work, I hit every hospital, at least on a quarterly basis, 
and visit a fair number of clinics in, in my travels as well. So not knowing what individual codes mean and in each location is problematic from knowing how to respond. You want to take the next one, Bill? Yeah, well, what, what we next did was we wanted to see what was the commonality among the codes across OSF. And uh, interestingly enough, not a single one of the codes was exactly alike at uh, which, uh, at that time, we had seven hospitals in our system, but uh, none was uh, was the same. So, so um, one of the things that we did was uh, we started moving forward and uh, looking at um, uh, we could go to the next slide, slide, please. Was to look at uh, what some of the different codes are. So we had three that had uh, the same color for code purple, uh, three that had uh, for code green, and some of the things really became uh, quite uh, comical. Oh, you can take take it away from here. Okay. Um... It, St. James, which is SJJ, WAMC, patient assistance needed. St. Joseph, which is very nearby, it was a bomb threat. We have staff who travel between those two buildings on a regular basis. So if you read these, and, and I'm not going to read all these to you um, during the course of the presentation, but in, you, you can look at these in the PDF versions, and you'll, you'll get a sense of how disparate the the code designations were across the system. And in some places, we had no code yellow or no code white. We didn't even have a standardization for our fire response around code red. We had others. But we had other codes like Dr. Major and Dr. Minor, code 1000, code Walker, all kinds of things that we, we couldn't even decipher. So um decision was made to take this to hand and figure out how we could bring some order out of the chaos that, that we found when we did the assessment. And the, the next slide is a spreadsheet that shows the distribution of the 31 codes across the OSF enterprise. I think the thing that's most notable about this is the number of cells that have no entries in them, which demonstrates how little standardization there was across the the entire ministry, the OSF ministry. So a um, small team of people sat down and had a, a series of meetings and developed a set of principles and concepts. So I'm going to let Bill talk to this because he was it was key in in establishing that framework that was used to determine which codes would be selected for the harmonization project. So one of the things that we wanted to do was understand a little bit about standardization. Why was standardization successful? Why was it uh, a failure? And one of the things we said is, is that uh, those who, who fail to study history are destined to, re to repeat the, the mistakes of the past. So uh, interestingly enough, uh, from a historical standpoint, there's a lot of literature on, out on that. And so there are concepts like preemption and uh, being the bigger player and having other assistance that uh, we ended up employing uh, as, a, a, as a strategy in terms of how to become more successful. Because um, you know, back in those days, we, fit, we had a lot of standards wars as we were, we were becoming uh, more of an operating company, or what we have now is what we call one OSF. And can you move to the next slide, Ode? Oh. There we go. It's a little pointy point on yeah. the screen. And so this is an example of uh, the great uh, picture from the Great Baltimore Fire. And the Great Baltimore Fire happened uh, back around uh, 1906 or thereabouts. Uh, really, uh, uh, the, the entire uh, city had uh, burnt down. And what had happened was that there were fire departments uh, from uh, New York City, uh, Washington, D.C., Wilmington, Delaware, Philadelphia, uh, Annapolis, uh, all kinds of places. And all the firemen had to watch as the city burnt down. And the reason why is because uh, the connectors between their hoses and the fire hydrants in Baltimore did not uh, uh, match up. 
And so uh, the, the problem was is that the insurance industry had been calling for 25 years for fire departments to have standardization. Now, in healthcare, one of the things that we hear is, is that uh, the reason we want to, have, to create change is to have a burning platform. I'm sure many of you guys have heard this before. And one of the things that uh, we're calling on uh, to at least to consider a national prototype uh, for code standardization is, is we don't want to have the burning platform. We don't want to have the disaster. The time to act uh, and move forward is now. So, oh, do you want to speak a little bit more about uh, some sure. of the things we've done? Yep. So the principles um, that we used to guide this project, number one, we took a look at what was already in existence, and um, Chuck rolled through several of the examples from the Hospital Council of Southern California, Kentucky, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and others. And we looked at those to see if there was any general pattern of the use of terminology among the 17 states, and then there were some other organizations that also had some publications. And one of the things that became clear was there's a national trend toward the use of plain, plain language and clear text. Um, one of the little hurdles we had to get past was the belief bias that stating things in plain language or clear text would be have the effect of yelling fire in a crowded theater. And after a lot of discussion, we realized that most of the stuff that we would include in plain language and clear text is information you hear over the public airwaves, whether it's a tornado watch or a tornado warning or something like that. Um, it was it was language that people hear every day coming from their television set or their radio, and I know I get these weather emergency alerts on my cell phone. The thing screeches at me like a fire alarm, or a, and and says and has a message in plain language about a weather warning in the area, whether it's flash flooding or a tornado or what happens to be. And then we made a decision, we, uh, a, a reasoned decision about which of the uh, announcements would be in plain language and clear texts and which would be color coded where we felt uh, an, a plain language announcement could incite a panic. This is the slide shows a list of states that have developed standardized codes and we, we took a look at all of those in this process. A good example. And of, I might add too, uh, Ode. Yeah. I'm sorry, Ode. I might add is, is that that list of states, uh, that was back in 2011, 2012 when we did this work. So I know that there's about uh, a half dozen more states that have since gone on and have standardized codes. Might not, if you're from a state that might not be on that list, that's most likely the reason why. Yeah, it's the, these are a little bit dated, but it's this is the, the story that we have to tell from that time that we followed. So one of the things I mentioned earlier is tornadoes. We made a very, what I think is a rational decision that when we get weather emergency information, it comes from the National Weather Service, and we simply state, in appropriate to the situation, there is a tornado watch in effect in Peoria and Tazewell counties until 2 p.m. today. Uh, this became a real significant issue a couple of years ago when there was a, a tornado, a very devastating tornado that traveled on the ground through central Illinois for over 100 miles that took out most of the, the small town of Washington, Illinois, which is across the river from Peoria and affected some areas of Peoria. Um, similarly, there's a confirmed large and extremely d dangerous tornado. Language like that was used when that tornado um, hit. It, it, it was uh, on a Sunday morning and, and uh, caused tremendous destruction, and several of our mission partners lost their homes in that tornado. But we believe that the early announcement of it helped um, some folks who were potentially in the path of that seek shelter or uh, move to a, an area of safety. So, Bill, you want to run through the, the codes here? Yeah, what we ended up doing, and, and I, I have to just say is, is that um, 
we did the best that we could at the time that we delivered this. And, and what I mean by that is, is that uh, as we're looking towards having something on a national basis, uh, do I think that uh, everyone should adopt the OSS system? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think that um, what we did is we created a structure in place that could evolve uh, over the course of time. And in fact, one of the questions that we had was, is, you know, what happens if, if uh, someone at, at a much larger institution, whether from the federal government or elsewhere, has a, a standardized system? And, and our response was, we're going to be in a better position because we've made these changes just because we had so much uh, variation. So uh, the things that we uh, uh, ended up uh, choose selecting based on uh, the principles that uh, Otis had mentioned are these five colors. And the thing uh, that uh, we chose with these colors is that we wanted to have uh, fewer colors on the basis that if you get more than five colors, uh, then what happens is that people are not likely to remember these. And we wanted things that people were, were most likely uh, to remember. Everything else, though, plain language, clear text. And, and I have to say, and, and Oath, uh, I'm interested in your take on this as well, but we just have not seen in the four years uh, since we have implemented this uh, any disasters related to plain language clear text. On the converse, what we have seen are many antidotes, antidotes where uh, uh, individuals have uh, reported that plain language and clear text helped during the course of an emergency. Yes, very much so. That's, uh, we've gotten unsolicited positive feedback about the use of plain language and clear text. People have just sent emails or called and to um, tell me or Bill or other members of the team, hey, this was great. First time I ever realized during an emergency what was going on and what I should be doing. That, that's been a real win for us. I want to point one thing out with respect to the, the colors. We use code silver as an unauthorized person with a weapon, and we did not, we had a very long discussion about whether to limit that to active shooter. We made a decision to apply it to a person with any weapon. It could be a baseball bat, it could be a knife, um, it could be a brick if that's going to be applied physically to somebody because active shooter doesn't cover a broad enough range of potential situations and and pretty much anything can be used as a weapon so we've tried to apply a rule of reason there that it's something that that could be reasonably assumed or presumed to inflict major physical injury but not limited to a, a firearm. And that's been useful. We've had a lot of discussion about that. And we've, we, thank goodness, have never had an incident where someone came um, with malicious intent bearing a firearm. But we've had situations in ERs and other areas of the hospital where someone picked up a, a, a tool of some sort that could be applied as a weapon. And we've used good de-escalation techniques and um, talked them out of it. And that's been the norm rather than um, having firearm-related events in, in the hospitals or the clinics. Uh, the next slide is our little iconic uh, graphic package that we've distributed at the time. This was part of the conversion process. This was uh, presented to every single OSF mission partner. At that time, we had about 13,000. Now we have almost 18,000. And we, re we, we review all of this information each time we go through an acquisition, whether it's a physician's office practice or new hospital. One of the onboarding activities is to replace whatever current codes they have with our standardized code process. And this touches the, the ears and the eyes of every single mission partner um, at least annually as part of our mandatory education process. Uh, it's been very helpful, as Bill said, a very limited number of colors. Uh, we do environmental care rounds as part of our Joint Commission accreditation process, 
and we ask people um, questions, just randomly encountered mission partners, we ask them, do you know what a code blue stands for? Do you know what a code silver stands for? And our compliance rate with respect to the knowledge is around, it's above 80% um, across the ministry. That's something that we track as a metric. You want to talk about this one, Bill? Yeah, so one of the things is that in the very early days when we said that we wanted to have these uh, five color codes plus plain language clear text, you could almost watch the, the color of some of the leaders' uh, faces uh, kind of go out because they, they what they're imagining was all kinds of mayhem and uh, all kinds of problems. And what we did is is, is, is we articulated the message in a way is, is that uh, half of our OSF facilities only have to make one or two changes. And when we expressed that, then they were like, oh, okay, so we only have to do, make a, a change from one color to the next or two colors. Then they were much more willing to, to embrace the change. And that's one of the things I think that, uh, you know, as we move forward is, is that, that let's also think of what it means for those folks who are trying to learn a new process, uh, especially in healthcare where it's so complicated. What is it that we can do that will make things easier for our leaders as well as for uh, the ones, those who we serve at the front line. So that that made the, the program feasible. I want to add one thing that's not in, in the slide deck. Um, the president of OSF Healthcare System is one of the sisters, Sister Diane Marie, um, and she put her imprimatur on this program. She made it clear to all the hospital presidents and the nursing leadership and operational leadership that this was a no options deal. Um, she had many questions about it. Bill and Chris and I and others had meetings with her to keep her up to date with our progress as we went through the program and developed it. And when we presented to her this material plus the booklet that we put together for education and training of our mission partners, she was all in. She said, there's no back door for this. This is something that we really need to do because I can foresee this becoming a bigger problem as we continue to grow as a system. Do you have any last, last comments, Bill? Uh, I don't. Uh, and I think with that, uh, I think we'll turn this back over to you, Chuck. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, what a terrific uh, overview. And we look forward to having uh, lots of questions. And I'm going to remind people that they can put, uh, they can select uh, down in the lower right hand corner and, um, and uh, ask questions because I think there'll be, uh, there'll be some good ones. Uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, introduce uh, James uh, uh, Mitchell and Aaron Friedkin, and uh, they both are at Texas uh, Children's Hospital. And um, uh, James uh, joined uh, Texas Children's in September of 2015. He's the Assistant Director of Emergency Management and Business Continuity, and has also had a longstanding history at Invesco, uh, and have been involved in IT crisis management, disaster recovery, and I know both he and Aaron uh, uh, contributed to the slides, and uh, we'll decide that whether which one will speak. Uh, so I'm going to introduce both of them. But he also worked at BP with Business Continuity, and uh, has a has a great passion for uh, this journey and uh, what can be done. And we just are just so blessed to hear where I am today at the Texas Medical Center to have MD Anderson and uh, Texas Children's uh, uh, both on. Uh, Aaron Friedkin is the man manager of the emergency management at Texas Children's Hospital. Um, he uh, uh, joined there after being at the University of Texas uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center for six years. Uh, he um, uh, has worked in the area of occupational therapy. He's an EMT, an emergency medical technician, certified health emergency professional, and has a master's of uh, science in disaster and emergency management. And in our discussions on 
uh, Texas Medical Center and how they can uh, collaborate together because of their juxtapositional nature. Their b buildings are just, you know, wall to wall and close together. And we have so many residents that move uh, across uh, all of these buildings, doing various rotations, going to scientific sessions and presentations and seeing patients that uh, what an enormous opportunity there is. Uh, Bill uh, Sharp, thank you for introducing us uh, uh, to this. And uh, we'll have uh, Aaron and James uh, now uh, kind of share their journey with us uh, uh, at Texas Children's. Very good. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity and are honored to speak to all of you as a part of this forum and share our experiences. One thing I would say is that we certainly don't have all of the answers. We're at the very beginning of our journey uh, trying to improve the communications that we do with our organization as a whole in terms of emergency communication. And so to give you some context as to where we are since my arrival at Texas Children's last September, there's a couple of things we've been looking at very specifically. And one of those is how do we communicate with our organization in an emergency or in a crisis? And we're combining that also with the implementation of a new emergency notification tool. So these two things coming together, of uh, having a tool that enables us to communicate more efficiently and then looking at language that enables us to communicate more efficiently as well, is driving us forward on this journey to ensure that we're able to get those messages out in a targeted and tailored fashion. And so in addition to the new tool and looking at the new language, there's, as you are all very well aware, there's other things going on uh, in our nation as a whole and globally, particularly around things such as active shooter. Uh, within our hospital here at Texas Children's, there's been a lot of interest in uh, active shooter or hostile intruder. How do we respond to that type of event? How do we keep people aware of what's going on? And so we conducted an active shooter drill at one of our campuses uh, towards the end of 2015. And one of the outcomes of that particular exercise was direction from the leadership of that campus telling us we need to find a way to communicate quickly and efficiently to our staff and to our patients so that we can get them actionable information in a timely manner. And so that then coincided with some of the work that was being done by the Texas Hospital Association, uh, some in 2015 and then stretching over into 2016 as well. The Texas Hospital Association set up a work group specifically to look at uh, this harmonization of codes and or plain language. And one of the things that came out of that particular work group were certain very important findings. And I found it interesting when we were going through the slides at the very uh, beginning of this webinar is to look at the variations amongst the various states who had potentially already harmonized their codes within state boundaries. One of the things that the Texas Hospital Association found was that when surveying all of the hospitals in Texas, there was a vast degree of variation in terms of what colors are used, what codes are used, what do those colors mean, there is huge variation within cities and in some circumstances, even variations within specific hospital systems. So one of the things that the work group was initially looking at was the possibility of harmonizing the codes, seeing if we could get everyone on the same page. And one of the things that was quickly realized out of that work group is that the degree of effort required to harmonize codes across all hospitals in the state would probably be better spent focused on implementing plain language such that the harmonization of codes was not quite as critical as it would have been otherwise. Uh, so again, some of the key findings were that there was vast degree of variation. And in addition to that, just coming out of it, the recommendation that one of the things we would need to do is, as a state, go in the direction of plain language. We here at Texas Children's, of course, have taken that recommendation and are uh, running through all of the appropriate levels of approval within our system to get that approval to proceed, cautiously of course, in the direction of replacing all of our codes in time with plain language. Now associated with that, um, Aaron was going to give us a specific example that's already been alluded to of why this would be particularly important to us here at Texas Children's within the medical center. So Texas Medical Center is unique in, in its size and breadth. We have two different medical schools, the University of Texas School of Medicine and Baylor College of Medicine and residents from those two institutions cover multiple hospitals. 
University of Texas medical students in residency will uh, practice medicine at both the Memorial Hermann Healthcare System as well as LBJ, which is a county hospital. And residents from Baylor College of Medicine practice here at Texas Children's as well as St. Luke's and Ben Top General Hospital, which is another county hospital. So you'll have residents traveling between institutions that have different codes, as was discussed earlier, different codes with different meanings. And uh, from my experience in the military, you always fall to your lowest level of training. So it's very difficult to jump between one institution as another. If you spend most of your time at one, the first thing that always pops into your mind is, if it's a code red, it means this, or if it's a code green, it means that. It's very similar to CPR. Those of us who've been doing it for a long time, you're so used to that 15 and 2 for compressions that when you move to 30 and 2, it was really difficult to force yourself to change because you've done it a certain way for so long. So those codes and changing between systems, even once they're done with their residency going on to another institution, you're always going to have that first one in mind. Thank you, and I appreciate that. And so that then helps us to kind of clarify some of the ideas that we're struggling with here and that we're looking to implement is why would we move to plain language? Well, plain language enables us to drive clarity and consistency in our messaging. Uh, as was mentioned in one of the other presentations, there are groups such as Homeland Security and FEMA, as well as the Texas Hospital Association for recommending use of plain language. And as Aaron said, the people who benefit most from our use of plain language would be our staff, our physicians, our contract employees, and anybody else who happens to be on the site. So again, as we're beginning this journey, where do we start? Vicki King and Bill Adcox have left the meeting. So the question is, where do we start? We have to start somewhere with this. Within Texas Children's, we have what are called our alert levels, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. You have your own variation of these things. Our existing alert levels, as you see on the screen, we've got normal operations at a level four, we have significant events, which are level three. We have high readiness or a CARLA alert, which is level two, and a maximum alert, which is a CARLA, which is level one. So I'm sure most of you are looking at that and thinking, okay, well, perhaps the number levels are somewhat counterintuitive. You might have done them in the reverse order. But in particular, I'm certain many of you are looking at those codes and saying, who in the world is CARLA, and how did CARLA get mixed up in our alert level? One of the things that I found when I came to Texas Children's last September is this CARLA language was scattered throughout the institution. It's in policies, it's in procedures, people talk about it frequently. The problem we have with it is that CARLA is a reference most people simply wouldn't understand. It's not clear to most of our staff. Uh, when I arrived, I thought surely CARLA must be an acronym that I somehow didn't pick up in all of my experience. Uh, when Googling the term CARLA alert, nothing came back, which I thought was rather odd. Come to find out that a CARLA alert within our institution refers to a 1961 hurricane that was devastating to our region. And so when you think back to 1961, most of our staff likely weren't alive in 1961, and those who were alive probably weren't old enough to remember uh, a significant hurricane, perhaps weren't even living in the area. So again, we're using at the very heart of our communication with our staff, a term that is essentially meaningless unless people are given the context and meaning around it. And so we've had certain specific incidents, uh, that one of which Aaron is going to talk about, which was our tax day flood, which highlighted the problems with this language. So for those of you not from the Houston area, the, uh, there was a local flooding event which occurred in April that we call the tax day flood, as it's in April. And so the, the communication that went out was for a CARLA, and the, the miscommunication there, we had several staff members who associated it more with the hurricane response of get to the hospital as soon as you can with your write-out bag. If your child is signed up for dependent care, bring them, and that will be set up because you might not be able to get to your normal daycare. Your life is going to change. And... Uh, that wasn't the intent. The intent was just to give out an alert. There was potential for flooding. There might be an issue with the next shift being able to get in or the previous and the previous shift being able to get out. Uh, 
Unfortunately, some staff put themselves in harm's way by rushing through flooded areas trying to get to the institution, and that was just a completely misunderstood intent of, of what the alert was. So the language itself was, was not clear enough with what the expected response was. Very good. Thank you, Aaron. And so coming out of that event and other events very similar to it, we approached our leadership with this problem statement that the existing cargo language was not clear, it's too subjective, it's too broad, and it lacks sufficient differentiation for different kinds of activations that we would need to implement within the institution. So our proposal was that uh, essentially we develop plain language alert levels that are both clear and concise that enable us to respond in a way that is appropriate to the particular incident that is occurring. So going on to the next slide, you'll see what we've proposed, and I want to highlight something that I think is an important differentiation from uh, the alert levels we've seen at other institutions and what we had previously. So as we go through these levels from uh, bottom, to, from top to bottom, uh, you're going to see that the language should be intuitive. It should be very clear as to what level we're at based on the understanding of the language itself rather than using color codes, rather than using numbers. And each of it would then be followed with very specific, tailored and targeted instructions to the particular audience receiving the advisory or load or so forth. I'll turn it back to Aaron and he'll take us through the first three. So normal operations or passive monitoring would be exactly that. If there's the threat of weather or uh, just during hurricane season, we're going to be monitoring the news, watching our regular weather forecast. If there's uh, uh, an advisory, we would move to more of an active phase. We have a contract with a meteor meteorological weather provider. We would call them, have conference calls. We would start communications with our uh, emergency management uh, partners in the area uh, on alert. We'd have communications going out to senior leadership, and then decisions would be made as to uh, global communication sent to the institution as a whole, or for an incident such as a uh, mass casualty incident or a decon incident, we would notify the emergency center staff, nursing leadership, and trauma service of, uh, of an alert in preparation for the influx of patients. And so that takes us through the first three levels of uh, our alerting system. The final two, I think, are very important in that we've removed some of the subjectivity from the alert levels from what we previously had. You'll see that we have what we call a partial activation and a full activation level, and those are directly tied to the incident command system and which portions of the incident command system we're standing up. So, for example, if we have a full activation, which would typically occur in an incident such as a hurricane, we would activate the complete incident command system with the incident command uh, group itself in addition to finance, logistics, operations, and planning. But the reality is we spend a huge amount of time in what we would call a partial activation, where we have stood up uh, the incident command center and maybe we've set up portions of operations or portions of logistics. That is where we spend most of our time rather than in a full activation. And so I think this is one of the critical things that we are implementing here at Texas Children is that clear differentiation between what we're doing for an event like a hurricane versus what we do more commonly for weather-related events, uh, maybe a small decon event, maybe a small mass casualty event, and so forth. Okay, so stepping on to the next two slides, I don't want to spend much time with these because there's a lot of detail there, but we had taken our leadership through uh, two sets of examples. One was for a no-notice event, and then the second step was for events related to escalating events like a hurricane where you can see it coming and it grows and grows and grows and you have time to prepare. Uh, when you're looking at the language that's being proposed there, it is reflective of the syntax that the Texas Hospital Association has proposed as being standard. Now, while we're looking at standardizing on a certain syntax for our plain language, the key element of plain language is whether or not we use a different syntax doesn't matter the language itself should be clear enough to drive action as long as the message gets to the appropriate audience. Uh, one more slide and we'll wrap it up. We think it's important as we're talking about emergency communication to realize that we have to have a layered approach to that communication, particularly some of you who are part of larger systems 
this will be all the more important. So, for example, if we have something that occurs here in the Texas Medical Center, which is just outside of downtown Houston, that impacts us very directly, we may be sending out an alert. Whereas our hospitals, our community hospitals, which are on the periphery of the city, may only be receiving an advisory. An example of that would be if we had an active shooter on our main campus here in the medical center, we'd clearly be sending out an alert to the campus as a whole, but we'd be sending out advisories to peripheral campuses, letting them know what's going on and that they ought not to come to main campus. Additionally, we'd be sending out a partial activation notice or even a full activation notice to the specific people who are expected to respond as a part of our ICS structure. So again, going back to what we had at the very beginning, what you see on the slide there, the communication has to be tailored and it has to be targeted. That then makes it possible for people to receive actionable information that they can use to keep themselves safe, to care for patients, and so forth. So with that, I believe we are wrapped up. We'll turn it back over to you, Chuck. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm sorry I was talking and I was muted to try to be careful not to speak. Um, uh, I just wanted to uh, give you guys the opportunity to be uh, reacting uh, uh, to uh, uh, Bill and Ode, if you could uh, react to what you heard from James and Aaron, uh, since it's so much fr so fresh in our mind, and, uh, and then uh, have James and Aaron re kind of react to what you're hearing and ask questions. And the MD Anderson guys, I've been offline uh, helping them with uh, uh, the phone. I've been listening to you all, but uh, uh, we're trying to help them with their, uh, you get on with the phone line. I'm here with Dr. Bo. So, uh, so uh, Bill and Ode, do you want to kind of uh, uh, react to what you heard and ask any questions of the guys at Texas Children's? Yeah, this is Ode. I think the last slide that's up with the different colored bands and the full activation in the center is a really important issue. Um, like any emergency response program, we, we, pr we have a framework for responding to events, and, and I think that's what these guys were saying in their presentation as well, is this is not a, a definite solution to any sort of event. It is a way of conveying information in a useful manner to the people most likely to be affected and presenting it with some conditional language that helps them understand the level of threat. And, and I like the, the four-layer deal with advisory alert, partial activation, and full activation. And I, you guys may want to comment on this. I assume that if you're going at, at whatever level that happens, you supply some additional information similar to what um, I read through on our two different tornado uh, watch and tornado warning uh, plain language slide. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, essentially what we do uh, I don't know if we still have control of the presentation, but we had uh, put up a couple of slides that talked to a, through a range of scenarios, uh, both no-notice events and escalating events, uh, some of which had actually occurred within our institution. There we go. We can go ahead and step back. And so what you see there is you see the situation. You see what the advisory potentially could look like, what the alert could potentially look like, and then what the activation full and partial could each potentially look like. So especially if you look at the alert column, you'll see basically what the syntax would look like. We'd send an alert uh, for a severe weather event and say alert, severe weather situation, and that would be followed by specific action that we need a discrete group to take. Yep. And, and, and that's the approach we take. We have a framework for emergency response, not, um, not an attempt at a solution for emergency response. And, Chuck and I were talking offline a little bit during my um, full-time consulting work. I worked with a, a a large organization that had a disaster plan that was over 3,000 pages long. And when we got finished and recast it as a framework that included um, a simplification of somebody was on mute there, simplification of the alert and uh, you know the the code alert system, it was 58 pages long. 
and people could understand it. And I think this is really important that it's it's not only simple to use by limiting the number of options for for coded, if you will, the the color coding um, and the rest in plain language and clear text, but provide people with useful information that's conditional for a specific situation. Absolutely. Uh, Aaron and I would be in complete agreement with that. There is nothing that, from an emergency management perspective, we find more frustrating than to be handed an emergency operations plan or other documentation that is so cumbersome that, in fact, no one is ever going to look at it in a real emergency. Right. right. If, it, if it's so complicated that when you pull it off the shelf and blow the dust off, it weighs two or three pounds, people are going to look at it and think, all right, well, this isn't happening, and they're just going to wing it. So any information you might have in there that's useful doesn't do anybody any good if nobody actually looks at it. So the more basic the information, the steps that need to be taken at the, the frontline employee level, the departmental level, the institutional level, it's best to keep it simple. But before any of that can happen, people need to know that there's a problem, right? So yeah. the plain language notification lets people know that there's something they need to react to. Right. The, the simplification is our current focus with our overall emergency management plans. Um, we're, I have a, for lack of a formal term, we call it the Emergency Management Council, made up of the person or persons from each of our hospitals and from some of our medical group regions who deal with emergency management as a major part of their work. And we're hammering out the principles of a framework that can be adjusted and scaled to any of the types of entities that we have, which range from a single practitioner, in the, the smallest sites we have have an advanced practice nurse or PA perhaps, and a couple of staff members and a few hundred square feet of space in a small rural town up to St. Francis Medical Center in Peoria, which has, a, it's, you know, we're, we're a small wing of, of the Texas Medical Center, but it's 2.6 million square feet. Uh, large complex quaternary medical center affiliated with a med school, goofy campus, hard to navigate, all kinds of things that can go up in smoke in, in terms of facilities or events. And um, our, our goal right now is simplification. Um, one of the guiding principles of that is that Everything we do is permanently complex. Our job is not to make it complicated by adding things to it that are unnecessary. And that is a really tough thing for people to deal with because healthcare folks want certainty. They, they love certainty. And building a system that's a framework that doesn't have certainty in it, um, requires a lot of discussion and evaluation and consideration because everybody wants to jump right to the end and say, well, how would we do this here? And the answer is, it depends. Right. So that's that's why we're, we're working toward that good framework um, that has room for maneuvering within it based on principles, and that's how we got to the harmonization of our codes, and, and that was in the slide presentation. As we established those principles, and then we applied them to simplify the um, code system. No, we think that's phenomenal. And one of the things that, as Chuck was mentioning, you know, here in the Texas Medical Center, not only were we literally building the building with you know 58, I guess, other institutions, but there are even some institutions where you're walking down a hallway and you find yourself in a completely different hospital, uh, simply going down the hallway. So moving in a direction where either it is harmonized or where it's using plain language so that people can hear and respond, keeping it simple, uh, we yeah, think yeah. is critical for all of us. Yeah. How big is well, that's, that's a great... now, like 18 million square feet, the whole campus? The, uh, Chuck jumping in here, it's uh, 50 million square 50. feet. Yeah, now you're bragging, uh, yeah, Chuck. Is almost, that because things are bigger in Texas? 
Absolutely. Yeah, you know our our capital our our capital in Texas and Austin, where my headquarters is, is 18 feet taller than the one in Washington D.C. Just to let you know. So, uh, but uh, but uh, no, about 300 buildings on 1,365 acres and 50 50 million square feet. Uh, I, I'd like to turn to Dr. Boats here and have him comment on behalf of MD Anderson regarding this issue of harmonization and. And the and this physical juxtaposition that we have of uh, the facilities. And Dr. Boats is a, a professor of uh, critical care at MD Anderson. He is also the medical director for the University of Texas Police Department at MD Anderson. And, Dr. and Chief Adcox and Inspector Vicki King are trying to get on uh, line. I don't know if they're on yet, but we'll have uh, Greg uh, perhaps uh, react to what he's heard from uh, both of you folks. And he's sitting right here with me at Texas Medical Center. I'm glad to hear this discussion by our emergency management folks because I represent a group of people that have to respond to these events. And uh, the more clarity, the more direction that we can have about what is happening and what resources we need to mount, uh, the better we can respond and help our patients and help our fellow caregivers in these uh, various events. Uh, when I was in medical school, I think there were only four color codes, and we had a pretty good idea of what to do. They were pretty standard, but as we become so much more complex in our healthcare systems, we have a lot more threats, and we have a lot more situations in which we need to change from normal operations to emergency operations. And what worries me the most, I think you've heard me talk in the past about active shooter events or workplace violence events, um, like the incident that happened in the West Anaheim Hospital, uh, my fear is that a code uh, designation will go out with a color and people will move towards the event rather than away from a threat, thinking that it means something where they need to give help rather than clear the area. And I wouldn't want our caregivers and our patients to be placed at more risk. So the idea of having clear language, um, plain text, um, structured communication so that everybody's on the same page makes us more effective in providing the care that we need to in as you said, either a slowly escalating event like a hurricane or just an all of a sudden event that can occur like a cardiac arrest, a fire, um, a workplace violence event and the, and the like. Um, anything that we can do to make the communication more clear, more structured and understood by most um, is an advantage to all of us. Here at the Texas Medical Center, we're so close together. Um, you know, our nursing staff may uh, leave MD Anderson and go to another institution to work and they don't even have to change their parking space. And they may do that frequently and they end up in a, an institution. In the heat of the moment, they may think about MD Anderson's code strategy rather than Memorial Hermann's and, and mount the wrong response to those situations. The more we can do to clarify these situations with clear language, the better the institutions can help each other, can provide mutual aid in circumstances where uh, either external or internal events are overwhelming our ability to, to care for our patients and each other. Um, I really enjoyed this presentation. I think it's, it goes a long way towards making it safer to work in these healthcare institutions. Great. Thank you, Greg. And uh, we do, I believe we have uh, uh, Chief Bill Adcox and Inspector uh, uh, Vicki King on, and they uh, had some real technical difficulties with WebEx. I think WebEx may not be running at max today. Uh, Bill and uh, Vicki, are you there? And I know you heard uh, part of the presentations on harmonization of emergency codes. And if you could uh, perhaps re express your uh, your responsibilities here at Texas Medical Center and the 20,000 people that you uh, are caring for that are, that serve and uh, and the importance of the, the uh, plain language and clear text and harmonization of emergency codes. Uh, sh sure, Chuck. This is uh, Bill Hancock, the Chief of Police. Uh, we we take care of uh, the, the University of Texas uh, Health Science Center and their six colleges and operations, as well as MD Anderson Cancer Center, which rep represents about 20 million of those square feet that you're talking about. Um, this was a, this was a fascinating uh, discussion, and with our with our partners at uh, Texas Children and Aaron and and, and so forth. Uh, I think I think it makes a lot of sense because. As you remember, sometime after 911, the, the, the Department of Homeland Security began looking at this whole issue of, of uh, interoperability, uh, people coming together and being able to understand what's going on and, and, and removing a lot of the clouds so there's clarity. And so one of the couple of things they said in, in the reports was that most hospitals, uh, most hospital staff will rarely keep track of uh, codes or even use codes. 
And another thing that I think was pretty profound is, and, and, and it makes a lot of sense to our discussion is, is that when you, when, when you use plain language, you exercise caution uh, when you're doing so. So when you use a code, you have very little clarity. But when you have to use plain language, it's a normal human instinct to be, to be a, a lot more cautious and then you can put the information out. So certainly there's training that has to go into that. But I do think that, that using plain language is really the way to go. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, we had a situation uh, a while back where uh, somebody had called a, a code silver, which is, you know, someone with a gun, and, and uh, uh, you know, people responded in that fashion. However, it just turned out that somebody had overheard somebody uh, talking about a gun. And so you don't have any clarity. You, you, know, you don't have any caution in that. And so you're going to get a, you may not get the response you want. The other thing that I, I'd like to add, if I can, is, is that think about today's workforce and think about hospitals. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of turnover. You know, physicians are moving around, nurses are moving around. There's a lot of moonlighting based on these new schedules. There's a lot of folks that work from home and then they come to work part of the time. And the fact that you have so many different uh, codes in place, they're just basically not going to be used or they're going to be uh, misunderstood and something bad is going to happen. Uh, so that's my point is, is that I think it's being in the law enforcement business nearly 40 years and responding to a lot of crisis situations, uh, having a real clear cut uh, way of letting folks know what's going on and what to do is, is, is paramount to success. Uh, Vicki? Yes, um, Vicki King and I, I'm, I am so thrilled to be part of this discussion because uh, in harmonizing these hospital codes, in speaking plainly to the first responders and to those charged with mitigating the damage or the issue that's occurring, um, we save lives. And I think that that's the bottom line for all the presenters that um, speaking plainly, clearly, concisely, and effectively is the best way to respond quickly and efficiently. And our team has um, worked tenaciously to resolve some of those issues. And I think that our speakers and um, the presenters today have, have outlined that issue extraordinarily well. Hats off. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Vicki. Uh, uh, you all um, are very progressive uh, uh, in terms of uh, moving what we would call left of boom, which is uh, before things, bad things happen, and are very actively involved in the preventative aspect of things. And some of the concepts that came across today were uh, the importance of standardization and clear communication. And, uh, and this, this all kind of plays into the left of boom concept. Vicki and, and, and Bill, would you, would you guys just address this concept of left of boom and where it came from and how you're working uh, so um, uh, in such a focused way on uh, prevention, uh, preparedness, protection, and performance improvement? And I'll just draw the attention to all of you. I'm moving the slides to the, to the, uh, to the polling. We'd like to have uh, you all, uh, I know one person is representing two or three that are uh, on uh, today, and I'm just going to run through the questions and then come back to you, Vicki and Bill, and have you guys comment on this idea of left of boom, boom, right of boom, and then have Bill and Ode maybe react to it, and then James and Aaron react to this, because I think we're really talking about combining forces, aligning focus, getting simplicity, but the whole purpose is to get up uh, left of boom. The first question though on slide 74 is, I am interested in participating in a national collaborative on emergency code harmonization and plain language. And Bill, this is for you. We, we wanna hear from this audience and uh, uh, regarding this issue uh, and how interested you all would be in collaborating, not just statewide, but on a national basis. And then the second uh, is a free text question. The emergency code issues I would like to uh, be addressed are, you know, one thing we need to learn is to always to listen. And um, sometimes we're just so prone to kind of talk about where we are and we don't listen. I'm sure there's some terrific, and uh, we always find terrific ideas that come from this audience. And so we'd like to have your thoughts on what issues you'd like to have uh, addressed. Um, the third question is, I am interested in a webinar on the latest data to support investing in teamwork taught by the global subject matter experts. And I know this, this 
put a quiver in the liver of my colleague sitting next to me because he had such a great passion for uh, teamwork. And Greg, this question is what we talked about yesterday of getting, uh, you know, there's now a business case for teamwork and working together the way that all of these organizations are, a financial case that can be taken to the boardroom. And we'd like to be able to review that metadata and have some of these global leaders uh, give us some of the ammo we need to get the resources we need. Um, the third, uh, the next question is, I am interested in a deep dive webinar on the errors of omission. This plays right back to the uh, longitudinal mortality uh, uh, topic covered by Dr. Huddleston. And then finally, the topics I want to see addressed in the future, uh, in future webinars are, and we'd like to hear the free text questions that uh, are the answers that you, that you all, uh, you know, have. Uh, there and I might preempt what I was uh, uh, and so what I'd like to do is I know it is a little bit off of what I've asked uh, Vicki <laughs> pardon me and Bill to address but uh, Vicki could you and Bill describe the continu boom continuum and 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 moving upstream to prevention preparedness protection and downstream to performance improvement Yes, thank you, Chuck. Um, when we talk about being left of boom, boom is a catastrophic event. Right of boom are all the mitigation and recovery issues, uh, uh, the way that we approach that issue, how we save lives after an event. Um, our focus here at um, MD Anderson UT Health is uh, looking for ways to get left of boom. How can we prevent the catastrophic event from ever occurring? Just like medicine has made incredible strides in helping people deal with injuries and illnesses, the focus of medicine has moved more to the prevention side, and that's where we are. We want to prevent these events from, from occurring, so we, are, uh, we prepare for those things. We, we look for innovative ways to reduce the threat level. Uh, Bill, you want to talk about the program um, and how we, we Evolved over time? Certainly. Chuck, you asked, asked the question where the term left of boom comes from, and it came from the United States military. Uh, and basically, in a short, what was happening is they were having soldiers that were blown up by IEDs uh, while over in the Middle East. And so they came to them and they wanted so, uh, money to harden these vehicles. So the, uh, the United States Congress, uh, I mean, allocated very, very large sums of money. Well, then they came back to them and said, hey, we need some more money because we need to do other things that are more proactive. And they said, well, I thought we solved that problem. And they said, no, 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 you just basically did close to boom or at boom where you could try to salvage a life as opposed to we need now money up front to get left of boom. And the thing they were talking about left of boom was to be able to develop relationships with the different tribes and the different villages uh, where they could actually uh, look at developing some information sources doing everything they could to, to stop the IEDs from, from the first place, from even getting planted. So left to boom simply means what can we do in every, every organization to prevent something from happening? So what we did is we, we, got, we worked really hard to be as proficient as we possibly can and to keep those skills current. So the currency is there as far as being able to respond to a major incident, whether it was an active shooter or something else. So we've done that and we continue to keep current on that. So then we take it a step further, and we've developed our threat management approach. So the first thing we did is put together a team and approach with a multidisciplinary, cross-functional group of individuals that are very proactive and forward-facing that look for, for, for indicators or behaviors that are of concern or their counterproductive workforce behaviors so that we can get involved early. Now, we do this not as a law enforcement initiative, not as a criminal justice approach, we do this under the under being uh, uh, of the concept we're call, we call institutional health, individual wellness. So how do we get to somebody in advance of of it hitting a crisis? So there's an inflection point when things are building up. How do we how do we gather enough information, connect enough dots, so that we can get engaged early enough to, to get some some individuals some help? And so that's really what left the boom is. So you. So we've developed this threat management approach, and it's pretty detailed, and it involves intelligence and analysis and, and so forth, but it's an institution-wide approach. And from that, of course, then you look at, the, at, the, at how some of that comes into your insider threat programs, and, and again, that's just another piece of that. But that's really what left a boom is, 
And, and candidly, what we're talking about here with plain language, clear text, is, 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 is a little bit left of boom because you're trying to stop something bad from happening by having clarity, by having everybody on board, by everybody being trained. So uh, I do think that more and more that we can do under the, all the great points that are made by these, these phenomenal speakers today is going to be very, very important. So that's how, that's, that's part of what our program is. So we have, we have the threat management piece, we, we call it the threat philosophy, and under that you have both the violent threats as well as the insider threats, and then we also have the, the drug diversion piece of that. So anything that can do damage to, to one's organization is all part of that. And you, you do those things in such a fashion by, by looking at social media, looking at DLP programs, looking at 149 programs, all these things that you put on, on top so that you have the right people in place, again, multidisciplinary cross-functional groups uh, in place that are, that, are, that are charged properly to look at this, these, this, this information, everybody's sharing in their information, HR is bringing their files to the table. We, we, need, we need to know, for example, who's on final notice and, and where's that going so that we can get out in front of it. So everybody's bringing their information together, we're looking at it collectively, and that's how we, we, we stay left to boom, as opposed to letting something happen and going in and, and responding to it and, and, and just picking up the pieces. Well, thank you, Bill. So this really kind of brings us back to you, uh, Bill, uh, Sharp, and Ode. Um, uh, we're, we're, you know, many of us on this phone call and those that will listen to it afterwards, uh, uh, there were a lot of competitive things today, so we had a, a little bit lower number than usual. We had 600 registered uh, last month and, uh, and we have about uh, half to uh, a third watch later. But what we want to do is make sure that everybody that is, that is listening today, and especially those of us in this room right now, um, uh, have the challenge of, how do we get, what, is, what are the key success factors to get the kind of alignment and the, the, the journey started? You know, you all did your harmonization project years ago. You could hear the intelligence and capability and capacity of both, uh, both James and, and Aaron. We're so blessed to have them within walking distance of where we are today. We're facing a challenge to try to get uh, these six to eight organizations that are within walking distance that all have different codes not only to get harmonized, but, but to really embrace the potential for plain language so that these 60,000 learners that are on this campus and the 100,000 employees that come in every day um, can be protected and we can get left of boom and get a warning before something happens. So Bill, you know, you've got the passion for harmonization nationally, we've got it locally. What can o, you and Ode share with us? Because, you know, we've got the talent in Dr. Boats and you can hear Chief Adcox and Inspector King and, 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 and James and Aaron passion, intelligence, they are grounded in the literature, they're bold, but what suggestions do you have for us? And, and hopefully that will help those that are in the audience that are saying, gosh, how do I get this across my three hospitals or my 10 clinics and two hospitals? I think that as Ode mentioned, the secret sauce for us, uh, knowing uh, where we had uh, failed, and that is, is that you have to have someone in your organization who at a leadership level says this is going to happen. And uh, we were uh, very fortunate. We had Sister uh, Diane Marie uh, indicate to us, and uh, I think that's it, you know this this is really about leadership. Whether this takes off on a national basis is going to be the success of uh, a couple of leaders coming around uh, the country and saying, you know what, this makes sense. Let's do it, and then plow forward. Oh, do you have any oh. other things you want to add? Yeah, oh, what, what thoughts do you have, especially drawing on your experience with the Joint Commission and the travels and advising so many organizations? Did we lose Ode? Then I'd like to come back to James. James and Aaron, uh, you're so recent at succeeding and you're, you're kind of on the home stretch and uh, this putting this great advisory sort of framework together. Uh, what advice do you have to our audience and what advice can you share with us on getting alignment outside the institution to get multiple institutions together? I, I think your experience and, and what you've been able to do is terrific. Well, in terms of internally, I would second what Bill said and having executive leadership, buying in, supporting it, and making the decision is absolutely essential. 
Uh, if we tried to do this on our own, driving this almost as a grassroots effort inside the organization, I can guarantee you it would have failed. Uh, what we were able to do is get buy-in from senior leadership, and they drove adoption of this initiative throughout the institution. So I would definitely say uh, buy-in from your senior leadership is absolutely essential to success. But then in relation to the Texas Medical Center as a whole, I'd say it's got to be very similar to that. Uh, each institution has to get their leadership to buy into this and to buy into the need to harmonize across the medical center as a whole. Uh, if it's not supported by senior leadership, then it will get lost amongst all the other priorities that are competing for time and attention. Yeah. Great, Aaron, your, uh, your thoughts. Oh, go ahead. You know, and then yeah, I don't, to, uh, I don't know what happened before. I was chatting away there and talking to myself, which I often find myself doing anyway. Um, <clears throat> Bill, spot on. Without Sister Diane Marie back in our play, this would have died in committee. Um, and there's a very well meaning and well prepared group of people that participated in this, but without the leadership imperative applied to that, um, it would have been, um, it, it would have just stopped. Fantastic. Uh, Greg, uh, uh, would you like to make a comment? I'm going to hand you my phone just in case uh, yours is not working there. So I'm going to give it. Well, I'd just like to, to echo what I've heard from everybody else. You know, this is a work in progress and uh, having leadership uh, support and having a group of people that are working on a common cause like this goes a long way for us to make uh, great strides in making our institutions safer and being able to help each other. Um, provide safe care in our close proximity. And I think that this is uh, a very worthy project for us to move forward on. Uh, Chuck, if I might interject as well. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, he just handed the phone back to me. Uh, okay, so this is Aaron from Texas Children's. Uh, one of the key components of an emergency management program is capturing lessons learned so that you can make changes accordingly. So I, I'd like to say that if a, a hospital wants to move forward with a, a program like this, it's really important to illustrate to leadership the benefit it has for the institution. So looking at incidents that have either happened within your own institution or happened elsewhere in the nation and taking those lessons learned and presenting them in a way that shows that, you know, uh, the wrong move can cost the institution not only millions in, in cost of, of response or damage, but also damage to reputation when things go wrong and your institution's a leader in the country and somebody can point to that little bit of a smudge on the reputation. So sometimes for leaders it comes down to what's in it for them and the institution and, and you really have to paint the broad picture of, of the benefits of making that change. Well, Aaron, thank you so much for cap, putting a capstone on our discussion. You know, we talk about the four Ps of prevention, secondary, primary and se secondary, keeping something from happening is primary. Secondary is the damage that could happen that is preventable. Then we talk about uh, preparedness, and that is being prepared, knowing we can't limit all of the risk, inside or outside of risks in these catastrophic issues. Protection at the boom, so for that, happening, but then you brought up this very important fourth P of performance improvement, the after action and understanding and understanding from others. And then there are three more P's, which is prominence, uh, your people and your property. And if we could protect them and look at those all cost hazards, I think that that, that continuum is great. Uh, I want to thank each and every one of you. If the speakers could just stay on for a minute so we can do a little performance improvement loop and, and be able to re report back to Fed or WebEx what, uh, what our technical challenges were so that we don't have some of the glitches that we had. I'd like to thank the audience for being on and those that are on, on demand. I uh, just want to make sure that everybody knows all the slides will be available uh, and this uh, this will be recorded and available on demand. And especially the final thanks uh, to Bill Sharp. Had it not had he not brought this up on a telephone call, we wouldn't have covered this very important topic that is so timely. So Bill, God bless you and thank you. And we thank all of you for attending and uh, we will be back with the webinar next week based on what we hear from you in this, uh, uh, in this questionnaire, t questionnaire today and in the ones uh, uh, that we've had over the summer. So thank you all speakers, please stay on. Have a great day.